Have you decided on red mulch or black mulch? Oh, man. I, my wife decides those, man. It don't matter what I decide. Morgan, you are not a macho man. <laughs> no, I'm, I, well, no, not at all. We're glad that you guys are back with us for another week. This is season two, I think episode six of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell, here in Ajax, Ontario. And if you haven't subscribed to CBC Sports YouTube channel already, go ahead and do that. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, leave a like. If you dislike what you're hearing, leave, leave a dislike. Comment with, comment. if you like it, comment. If you dislike it, don't matter. All engagements matter. We're just trying to please um, the algorithm. Now, I don't do this alone. I do this with the best panel in the business um, joining us from Washington, D.C., uh, Hamilton native, Megan McPeak. Hello, hello, fans. <laughs> and also in Washington, D.C., author of uh, 10 books with an 11th on the way, uh, one of the busiest people in this business, Dave Zion. Washington, mystics. Listen, we're going to make that catch on one way or the other and just make sure people credit you. Um, so this week, uh, another busy week, we have a lot to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about Kyrie Irving, Irving and him uh, keeping his focus on a really tense and sad situation um, in Gaza. Uh, we're also going to talk uh, WNBA, obviously. Um, we're also we, we're going to talk about um, an athlete, left-handed, evangelical Christian, born in the Philippines, peaked uh, 2010, 2011, around there, but just will not go away. Um, audience, I'm going to let you guys decide between now and when we do this, whether we're talking about Manny Pacquiao or Tim Tebow, and then when we get to the segment, we'll figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> but first up, WNBA 25th season tipped off this weekend. Uh, made my family really happy, only because uh, the Connecticut Sun, they have John Quell Jones, they have Luana Bonner. The two of them combined for 47 points. I think it was in the season opener. And the headline said, all the headlines said, I think it was the AP headline because it picked up everywhere. Jones and Bonner combined for 47 points. And that made my mom, my aunt, my cousins really happy because in our family, my mom is a Jones. Uh, Joneses and Bonners are all over the place on my mom's side of the family. So when they see Jones and Bonner combining to make magic happen, they get happy. So shout out to my mom, my aunt Peggy. There you go. Joneses and Bonners. We're still all over the place. Megan McPeak, uh, what stood out to you WNBA first weekend in terms of a storyline that we need to keep watching? I think really just the, the parody across the board this season. And we saw that last season in the what was affectionately known as the Wubble down in Bradenton, Florida. But now that they are playing in their home markets, obviously the uh, pandemic has become more under control that is allowing them to do this and giving them more uh, more frequency in testing, the vaccine rollout, as we know. And now you're seeing players that were not playing last season who opted out for whatever reason it may be, they've returned. Uh, to your point, John Quell Jones was one of those players who opted out last season from the bubble. And she's returning. So any for me, it's really and truly all of the players coming back to the floor who we did not see last year, uh, obviously Elena Deladon, Tina Charles, Natasha Cloud here in Washington, D.C., as Dave mentioned. Uh, you've got um, Christy Tolliver out in L.A., Chenea Gumike out in L.A. who did not play. Uh, multiple players returning to the floor. That is what I am most excited about. I'm going to pay attention to this season because you have to now reacclimate yourself. And training camp is only two weeks. You've got to reacclimate re yourself on the fly during this season. And I'm just really excited to see these players back on the floor. I love that Cheney is like a, a, a full-time analyst, but <laughs> also Army still a full-time, <laughs> right. But also still a full-time pro player. She's like uh, uh, Andre Ward in boxing the last couple of years of his career, uh, call him the fights on HBO. And then he gets the call from the manager. Oh, I got a fight coming up. All right. Uh, let me wrap my hands and get to it. Uh, it's, <laughs> Not too easy, two really difficult jobs to juggle, but she does it so well. Dave Zirin, uh, the big, sorry, because Megan is not a Washington Mystics fan. She's the play-by-play -play voice. You, Dave, are the Washington Mystics fan. What uh, stood out to you about the first weekend of WNBA season? Well, actually, nothing to do with the Mystics, which is to be thought since the game did not go as one would <laughs> like. I think the meat big story is the cinematic nature of the opening night. I mean, mm. to have two players, Sabrina Ionescu and Diana Taurasi, hit game winners on the opening night, 
these two athletes are almost 20 years apart from age. It just, in age, it just felt like this incredible book ending of the talent that is and the talent that is to come. The WNBA could not have scripted a better opening night than to end with those two shots, which went totally viral. That to me was the open, it was the story of the night. You know, a lot of hype going in and then the hype is not only met, but it succeeded. Yeah, David, scripted is a good word because uh, we love sports because it's not scripted. And we in the, in, in the industry, we like to tell these stories because they're not scripted. But at the same time, we love a story that seems like it's scripted to the to, almost to the detriment uh, to the quality, to the detriment of the quality of the storytelling. It's one of the problems that a lot of people have with, say, watching the Olympics on NBC, where they like to show everything on on tape delay so they know who won and then they build the schmaltzy backstory uh, ahead of time and, they, and then they package it for you and and, and broadcast it, but it, it, it really siphons a lot of the drama out of the event. But here you have, as you said, two stars at opposite ends of the age spectrum, um, hitting these shots in ways that are going to grab the attention, one of the hardcore fans, but two of the casual fans who may or may not have been paying attention, but they are scrolling uh, through Twitter, through Instagram, and they get to see these things. And it's one of these, uh, uh, one of these well-placed, well-timed highlights that can over time uh, lead to a bigger audience. My question to you, Megan McPeak, is how soon do you think we're gonna see a WNBA franchise in Canada? I think it is on the horizon for Canada. I think it's an area that can definitely do well. We obviously know the abundance of fans for the game of basketball, period in the country of Canada. We have seen that especially too on the women's side with the emergence of the Canadian senior women's national team and the success that they have had, not only at FIBA America tournaments, uh, at world tournaments and at the Olympics. And what we saw in 2012 back in London with the emergence of the senior women's national team and the athletic uh, talent that they put on the floor. And then again in Rio, continuing to move the needle and push the narrative that the Canadian women are there to be reckoned with. And now we're going to be able to see it in Tokyo this summer, should the games continue to be happening. I know it's a conversation we've continued to, to, to mm -hmm. have on this show, but I definitely think that Canada will be a great spot for the WNBA to expand when they are ready. I know, you know, WNBA fans and basketball fans are chomping at the bit to find out when the WNBA will continue to expand. We'd like to see more people, uh, in this league because it's only 144 women that is a tough number to crack a roster spot so the more we can get more rosters more players on these rosters we can then dive into the deep depth of talent that the women's game have so i definitely think it will be soon i think canada is on the list for potential expansion sites and cities and i truly hope that the WNBA can look at the best cities possible that you can expand this league because i think truly as a basketball fan, the league needs to expand. I want to see more women play this game at the professional level and not have to see talent uh, get cut because there is just not enough roster room the way that we see it right now. Right. With a, with a small league, and again, 100, only 144 players active at one time, the luxury that the WNBA has is that they can expand without diluting the talent pool, because I guarantee you, if there's only 144 spots, there's 12 more players that are that good. There's 24 more players that are that good. They just happen not to be in the league. Now, Dave, I know you've written a lot about sports team ownership, the good, the bad, the extremely ugly. And what I'm curious uh, to know from you is, and, and I, you know, I, in my days as like a, a daily news reporter, I wrote a lot about um, sports teams, sports ownership, and like the environment that's necessary. And, and one of the things that the experts would tell me is that if you are trying to uh, have a sports team startup, especially in a big league, you have to be comfortable losing money for a few seasons. Um, but what we're seeing now is a lot of, uh, <laughs> we talk about this all the time, like uh, people who see sports teams as investments that are going to pay off in the mm -hmm. short term. Like this is why you have this European footy super league. This is why you have, um, private equity trying to buy, buy into the New Zealand All Blacks. My question to you, David, is uh, knowing what makes a good sports owner, but then also knowing the types of people that are trying to own sports teams right now, how do you find like an ideal owner for a new uh, WNBA team that would say show up in Canada? I don't know. I just did a panel with Dawn Trudeau, the owner of the Seattle Storm, and she certainly okay. seemed uh, very ideal in terms of her outlook, her approach, her commitment to the league. And I think with the WNBA, I mean, it, it's a it's a bit of a different operation because 
like if you if you can find an arena and every city has an arena like this that seats um, you know up to five thousand people, um, we know that the salaries in the WNBA are not in the same stratosphere as the NBA, um, and we also know that there there is a, a thirst. For, for basketball and there's a thirst for women's basketball that's coming up. And so I think you don't, you don't need the sort of billionaire hedge fund bond villain, Elon Musk wannabe to make this a reality <laughs> and to make it happen. You can do it with somebody who just has a deep heartfelt commitment to the game, to the sport, to women's sports, but also sees the growth opportunity and potential there as well. So I just think the WNBA is just situated to have a different kind of somebody in the owner's box than some of the bigger sports leagues that require that kind of hedge fund capital investment. And also, as we saw in Atlanta this last offseason, if you get somebody in that owner's box who's a little bit hinky, the players are going to have something to say about it. And I think that creates its own kind of straining mechanism to make sure we get the best possible people. Dave, I'm going to stay with you for a second um, and sort of and stay with basketball as well, because, you know, there are things going on in the world uh, beyond the field, beyond the baseline, but still affect the people playing. Um, so Friday night or Saturday night, Kyrie Irving. Um, sorry. Yes, it was Saturday after Brooklyn beat the Chicago Bulls uh, is doing his post game media availability. And Kyrie Irving has recently converted to Islam. And he let the reporters know that, like, once the game ended, basketball wasn't on his mind. A lot of stuff is going on in this world, and uh, basketball is just not the most important thing to me right now. There's a lot of stuff going on overseas. All my people are still in bondage all across the world, and there's a lot of dehumanization going on. So He's speaking specifically about uh, Gaza where the Israeli armed forces have been undertaking airstrikes for at least a week. I don't have the, the statistics off the top of my head, but the, the casualty count uh, is climbing. It's becoming quickly, or it has long since become uh, a humanitarian crisis. And Kyrie Irving, to my knowledge, Dave, I might be wrong, but uh, you can take this on, is like the first uh, high profile athlete in a mainstream American sport uh, to take this on and use like the, the league mandated uh, press availability time to say, hey, this is what I'm going to discuss. Now, do you th Dave, do you think this is uh, that Kyrie is going to be the first of many or, or this is just kind of where it's going to uh, stop? Oh, no. I mean, already you've seen uh, Damian Lillard also mm -hmm. uh, put out um, an Instagram post talking about the need to free Palestine. Uh, his teammate Yusuf Nurkic has done the same. Uh, you've also seen um, Laisha Clarendon of the WNBA put out um, statements and retweets. Uh, you've also seen a couple of uh, stop, top stars in women's soccer do the same. And I know this is a little bit shallow and a little bit narrow in terms of the number of athletes who are speaking, but I think it represents a rather important sea change. And I think it reflects something much larger, like just like you're seeing members of Congress and the Democratic Party uh, start to give floor speeches against uh, Israeli aggression and the indiscriminate bombing of civilians, the killing of children. You've seen all of these things come out of Congress where in the years past, you never would have seen that. Similarly, in the world of sports in the United States, you're starting to see the beginnings of that. And, you know, the reasons why are because in the process of building a Black Lives Matter movement in this country, there have been a lot of connections that have been made with the Palestinian struggle. Um, Ange Angela Davis wrote a book called Freedom is a Constant Struggle from Ferguson to Palestine, you know, a book that's gotten a lot of attention and been very widely read. So the connections and this idea that there's a new internationalist consciousness against racism mm -hmm. and against oppression is starting to reflect itself in the world of sports in a way it wouldn't have in years past. And part of me just finds it funny because all year you've heard uh, sports journalists say, why won't Kyrie Irving talk to us? Why won't Kyrie Irving talk to us? And then it's like, okay, you want me to talk to you? This is what's on my mind. So I think that's the lay of the political land right now. There's some very important shifts taking place on this issue that I think sports as a weather vane, would, we, are, we would do well to recognize. Yes, and Kyrie Irving, like is, for whatever you think about Kyrie Irving, if you think he's a selfish player, if you rightly criticize him for thinking the world is flat, although we don't know if he, think, if he still thinks that, but he thought that at one time. Um, but by using his post-game availability to raise this issue now, this, this brings this issue uh, 
to the eyeballs, to the consciousness of people who might not otherwise have thought about this, who only tuned into Sports Center, who only pulled up uh, ESPN.com to think about basketball. It, it, it puts this on your mind. It puts this on your plate. And you don't have to be either like an expert on the issue to understand uh, what looks like a fair fight and what doesn't look like a fair fight, what proportionate responses and what self-defense actually is. You don't have to be an expert to understand that uh, you cannot um, you cannot bomb uh, an office building. Yeah. It's full of newsrooms and offices because those people aren't soldiers. And doing that, uh, you are uh, coming very close, if not actually committing a war crime like that. None of that has to do with uh, what side you think you're going to take in this conflict and who you think is righteous or, 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 or um, worrying about weighing in because you think someone's going to paint you as anti-Semitic or Islamophobic. Like, uh, proportion is proportion. A fair fight is a fair fight. Uh, bombing an office building is bombing an office building. My question to you, uh, Megan McPeak, is can NBA players like Kyrie Irving, like, can they continue to weigh in on this with, without courting the kind of mess that we saw a year and a half ago or two years ago with Daryl Morey and China and LeBron James? Is there sort of a clean, cleaner way through this? I think it all stems from education. And that's something that we saw over the course of the summer and the fall with everything that, you know, happened with social injustices and the uprising of social injustices in the United States of America and people educating themselves uh, to be able to speak on these topics and speak comfortably on these topics. And I think that's what Kyrie Irving did uh, with utilizing his mandated press conference. And he spoke from he spoke from the heart, he spoke from his mind, and it, it came from a place of education because he obviously had things to stay things to say, excuse me, that didn't come from a place of guessing. It didn't come from mm -hmm. a place of unknowing. He clearly has been paying attention to what is going on. Obviously, Morgan, you mentioned recently uh, uh, converting to Islam and, and playing through Ramadan, uh, which is something that he's spoken on as well in the last couple of weeks and something that we've seen other players speak on in the last couple of years, most notably Ennis Cantor. Um, but I think the biggest thing is it comes from education. You can't speak on something if you're not educated on it. Mind you, you can, but you may look silly doing so. And these athletes, you know, specifically my experience uh, to talk on the NBA and the WNBA, that's the one thing that these athletes consistently do is they don't speak on something if they don't know or have the education behind it. And that's a huge respect I have for, for both athletes in both leagues is the fact that they take the opportunity to see something that they feel is wrong or unjust and they educate themselves if they are unknowing of the topic and the situation so that if they do feel comfortable enough or they do want to speak on it, they can do so and, and bring light to something that maybe those reporters may not be uh, paying attention to or may not have the ability to write on uh, because they're covering sports. So I think that's the biggest thing that anybody truly, not just athletes can do, is just educate yourself before speaking on the topic and speaking on something so that you don't say something that could cross the line or be uh, misconstrued or misunderstood. And then you have to you know, do what we sometimes see is issue an apology or mm -hmm. uh, a clarification. So I think that's the biggest thing that these athletes do, uh, specifically, again, just NBA and WNBA, is educate themselves before they speak on a topic publicly to the press. Yeah, Megan, you raised an important point, and I am a firm believer. Like, this is one of my core tenets, that everyone is not entitled to an opinion. You hear this all the time. Everyone's entitled to your opinion. No, you're not. You're entitled to an informed opinion. If you don't know the topic, you got to gather the information because your opinion does not equal the expert's opinion. And that's how it goes. And so uh, there is a qualitative difference between um, Daryl Morey hitting retweet on a free Hong Kong tweet and then deleting that tweet when the blowback gets too hot for him. And then all of a sudden this whole conflict landing on LeBron James's lap, big difference between that and Kyrie Irving actually following the news out of Gaza and following the news out of Israel and watching the casualty count, count climb disproportionately uh, on the Palestinian side and saying, hey, this is enough. You guys wanna talk to me? This is what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about tonight. Uh, Dave, on this topic, last word to you. Well, just to say, I agree with what folks are saying. I also want to um, acknowledge that oftentimes um, that's used by, that's a tactic by the Israeli state to say, how dare you 
call what's happening here racism. How dare you call it indiscriminate bombing? You're not educated on the subject. You don't know the difference between an Ashkenazic and a Sephardic Jew. You don't know the difference between uh, Sheikh Jarrah and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And, and they, they throw out a lot of very specific facts that frankly you would need a master's degree to understand the complexities mm -hmm. of and that's because in a lot of respects the situation is extremely complex but on the other hand there are some things that i think anybody can understand just by following the news the issue of proportionality that you raise mm -hmm. the issue that they're bombing an area in gaza that doesn't have its own army or air force or anything it's basically an open air prison of two million people uh most of whom are refugees half of whom are kids um, so those things are just basic facts and anybody can have an opinion on that. Um, so it is important to be educated without question. I agree with that. It's also, I think people can look at a situation and say, wait a minute, right is right and wrong is wrong. And I feel like I need to take a side on this. Perfect, Dave. Um, whew, that's a lot, that's heavy. And that's another story again, we'll continue uh, to watch and monitor. In the meantime, audience, um, I'm gonna give you guys a second uh, to figure out whether at the top of this show we were talking about Tim Tebow or Manny Pacquiao. Um, ah. <laughs> Dave Zyron, who are we talking about? Tim Tebow, no question. Tim Tebow. <laughs> no question. Listen, at, at a certain point on this show, we are just going to have to have like a weekly segment dedicated to the crazy decisions Urban Meyer is making down in Jacksonville as long as he has as long as he has that job as the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, which might not be for too long if he keeps doing what he does. Dave, what do you want to call this topic? This uh, Urban blight, of course. Urban, <laughs> urban blight. Okay, so to get you guys caught up, urban blight. Um, Tim Tebow, as the NFL Network reports, is on the verge of signing a contract with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And joining this team would reunite him with his college coach, Urban Meyer, who took over as the Jaguars head coach this past offseason. Um, the thing about Tim Tebow is, one, he has not played professional football in, I think, nine years. He's 33 or 34 years old, and he's also switching positions, allegedly. He's going to play tight end uh, to the extent that he plays for the Jaguars. Megan McPeak, uh, how excited are you about Jacksonville's native son, Timothy Tebow, coming home to line up at tight end for the Jacksonville Jaguars? I am not at all excited and uh, they're still gonna have under six wins in my opinion. So that's all I've got. I, I think this is the silliest PR stunt I've ever seen. Um, the fact that, and yes, I'm gonna bring it here. The fact that a nine year hiatus from the NFL uh, allows him to turn around and get a contract and yet Colin Kaepernick is still uh, very viable at the QB position and can't even get a phone call. Um, and yet you have teams bringing in QBs who some, fans who might even be football fans probably don't even know who they are. Uh, Green Bay Packers, I'm looking at you. Um, and, you know, I, I just, this, this is one I don't get. I don't know if it's, you know, Urban Meyer being like, you know what, Tim, we're just going to bring you in. What we're going to do, we're going to let you line up one time and then I'm going to need you to just retire and join my coaching staff. Like if this is all just get him on the coaching staff, this is too much. This is too much, Urban Meyer. Like we're doing too much here. Couple of things. What can Tim Tebow tell NFL players about playing in the NFL? Like who's who's going to listen to Tim Tebow? He's he can't mentor Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence is already fifty times Trevor the quarterback. Lawrence, Tim Tebow. Trevor Lawrence was. could could mentor Tim Tebow. Exactly. And before we go to Dave, here's another thing. Um, Tim Tebow is from Jacksonville. Got it. Uh, and so he would figure to sell tickets to the extent that you're allowed. No, in Florida you can sell as many tickets as you want. There's no COVID restrictions anymore. But the thing is, you don't need publicity sense. We talked about this offline. And this is a Toronto Argos. I could get it because you kind of need that to sell um, gridiron football here in Toronto, especially, you know, if it was the CFL, you don't need stunts to sell football to Floridians. I'll tell a quick story about 20 years ago. I was not too long out of school. I was on a job interview at the Florida Times Union, which is the newspaper in Jacksonville. So I was there for a couple of days. They were showing me around the town and they kept telling me about, hey, we just got this NFL, NFL team a few years ago. We're really on the verge of becoming like a top tier American city. I wound up in this meeting with these senior managers. Um, uh, and the, the I wanna say she was the managing editor. It was a woman, can't remember her name, but she, she was from, uh, 
she was from the lower Great Lakes, like somewhere in between Buffalo and Chicago, where everyone has that accent. If you're from Toronto, you know, you know the accent, like on the Fusilla Ford commercials, you know, the Lockport Gambino Ford commercials, that accent, like the super fans uh, uh, on Saturday Night Live. Huge. That was the accent she had. So now I asked her, I was like, okay, well, everyone's telling me that Jacksonville is like almost the top tier city. I asked her, I was like, well, what's the one thing Jacksonville needs to, to, to vault from where it is now to the level of you know Chicago, Boston, uh, Los Angeles. And she said to me immediately, a biak up quarter biak. Point being, these folks are completely plugged into football. They don't need Tim Tebow to get them to like football. Dave Zyron, what is this hold that Tim Tebow has over people, especially over Urban Meyer? Uh, you know, that, that's a question for Urban Meyer, but I'll tell you that the effect this is gonna have in the locker room uh, it's not going to be like, hey, look, it's Tim Tebow. Maybe he can mentor us about <laughs> nothing. Uh, the, the bigger issue is that Tim Tebow is going to be taking a roster spot in that training camp from someone Thank who you. might be a, a, a young seventh round tight end, you know, trying to scrap, make it in the league. And so many people in that locker room are going to have le lived a similar path. You know, people aren't superstars like Tim Tebow before they're age 20. You know, people are clawing and scratching to get a chance to play in the National Football League. And so for Urban Meyer, this is just yet another move that is going to breed resentment in his locker room because he's dealing with a series of grown men, not scared college students that he can stand above them as if he's Douglas MacArthur you know, standing over his army. It's such a different power dynamic when you get to the National Football League, uh, even in places like New England with Bill Belichick. It's a different power dynamic. Mm -hmm. And Urban Meyer, once again, is showing again, and it won't be the last time, that he does not understand the power dynamics in the National Football League. This is ridiculous. This is mascotting, bringing yes. Tim Tebow onto the team. This is stunt casting. This is circus tomfoolery. This is Bill Veck owning the Chicago White Sox and putting a little person, Eddie Goodell, up at home plate with number three eighths and <laughs> getting fined by the league for it. This is silliness. And unfortunately, the NFL, NFL players are a very serious bunch, so they're not going to feel like they're in on the joke. Well, the difference being that Eddie Goodell got a walk in his one plate appearance. Ah, and so... True. His OPS is off the charts. His on-base percentage is off the charts. He contributed. Like, Tim Tebow's not going to contribute. And that's the other difference between Tim Tebow and all these other people uh, lining up, competing for roster spots. This is a young team. And yes, and I know young teams also need veterans. But Tim Tebow is not a veteran. He's just old. He does not have a ton of NFL experience. He's not going to contribute. Here's to, here, to me, is Tim, Tebow, Tim Tebow's legacy. Tim Tebow is the one person you can think of. And I want you guys to, to go through your mental Rolodex right now, all sports. Um, Tim Tebow is the person who broke, who severed the relationship between hard work and fundamental soundness, okay? Because any other player, any other sport, when you tell me that somebody is hardworking, this guy works harder than anyone else in the room. It shows on the field in terms of that person's skill set, the little things that they do really well, the skills, like the repeatable things, the things that you can only learn by repetition and by rote, right? Tim Tebow can't do any of that. All I hear is that Tim Tebow is this hard worker, this hard worker, this hard worker, but then you put Tim Tebow on the field, Tim Tebow has a long, slow release. Tim Tebow does not throw accurately. Tim Tebow does not uh, make good decisions with the football. These are all the things that a hard working quarterback should be able to do. So in that sense, Tim Tebow is an absolute marvel because I've never seen some, and I've never seen another athlete work so hard for so long and still yield so little uh, tangible, fundamentally sound well, skill. Dave, you're going to say something. Say, you, you asked about who you who just described. You just described the majority of people who play professional sports. Yes, They're toiling in the minor leagues, toiling in, in places that you know that they have nobody in the stands to watch them. Most people who want to be professional athletes, that becomes a failed dream. And these folks work their behinds off and don't get a sniff of the big time. That's the reality of sports. It is a brutal, brutal road if you're not some kind of superstar. And yet Tim Tebow is the one who cracked the code somehow. Not good <laughs> enough. 47% from uh, <laughs> passing completion. Not even close to an NFL level, yet getting shot after shot after shot. I mean... I think he's the poster child for white privilege. I mean, it's just difficult to describe it any other way because 
you know, and I don't, I don't usually throw around that phrase loosely, but it's like, I'm exact. I'm like just looking so closely for a reason about why he gets like, it's like fantasy camp play for the Mets. Sure. Play for the <laughs> Mets. Sign with the jets. Yeah. What, what, what the heck, you know? And it's just all of these opportunities one after the other. And he's so hardworking, but it doesn't show on the field in many ways. He's the patron saint of every ham and egger out there who's not able to make it to the top level. Take all that to mean that our panel is unanimously out on Tim Tebow continuing uh, his NFL career. (laughs) Because I don't get it. I don't understand it. Uh, But we will see what happens and see how long before Urban Meyer starts drawing up gadget plays for Tim Tebow. Hey, why don't we do a tight end pass? And then just starts easing him closer and closer and closer to center until he's saying, hey, Trevor, just stand back, Trevor Lawrence. Why don't you let Tim Tebow run with uh, the first stringers? Just, 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 just for kicks. And next thing you know, it's opening day. And here's QB1, Tim Tebow. Uh, in or out, guys, real quick. Let's do this. Uh, NBA play-in tournament starts Tuesday night. So by the time the, the internet at large sees this clip, they'll be playing in. So it looks like Memphis and San Antonio – and then L.A. versus Golden State, which is like a marquee matchup, Steph versus LeBron. Uh, and so one of these teams has a chance of not making the playoffs at all. <laughs> Indiana versus Charlotte. Uh, Boston versus the Washington Wizards, who only get a six-point handicap from, from Megan being around them instead of the full 12 like the Mystics get. Uh, Megan McPeak, my question to you is, are you in or out on more – leagues adopting like alternative creative playoff structures i am in on this i like this situation i think over the course of the season the nba got exactly what they were hoping to get out of this play-in situation and this play-in tournament idea which was fans paying attention throughout the entire season but also to mm-hmm. teams not doing what we've seen in the past which is tanking for the lottery pick so i am a thousand percent in on leagues doing what they feel is necessary to try and tinker with getting things back to way the way they used to be when you think of 90s NBA basketball and the fight to get into those top eight. Perfect. Dave Zyron, you in or out? All the way in because in my sporting fan life, it begins and ends around the Washington DC teams. And I think <laughs> the Washington Wizards, which ended as the eighth seed, yes. I think one of the things that drove that team and motivated them was the idea of pushing into 10. So I feel like they fell into the eighth scene. It took the collapse of Charlotte for them to get there. But the the idea of making the playoffs, I think, made a huge difference to that squad. Perfect. I am out only because this doesn't go far enough. I like, I don't mind the play in because again, it's, it's drama in the middle of the pack. Uh, but what I would love to see is what they do again in footy uh, overseas, what they do in, in, in uh, rugby league in England, where you have promotion and relegation and create some late season drama from the top of the table all the way to the bottom. Uh, and it, obviously the NBA can't quite work that well because there's not like a, a, a second league where you can promote teams, but um yeah, what, what, whatever leagues can do to create uh, drama and tension throughout the standings, throughout the season, I'm all for it. Now, this next topic, we're all in to an extent. Uh, what the variable is, who we're in on. Uh, big week for Canadian distance runners on the track. I'm going to run it down really quick. Uh, I hope I don't mess up this person's name. Uh, hopefully somebody can correct me if I get it wrong. In Los Angeles, Andrea Secafien. Uh, Friday night, set a Canadian record in the 10,000 meters on the track. She ran 13, sorry, 31 minutes, 13.94 seconds, basically took a half a minute off the existing Canadian record, which is insane. Uh, Won that race. She's qualified for the Olympics, hoping we have them. Uh, Same weekend, Saturday night, Kate Van Busker, who I used to watch when she was growing up, when I was coaching high school track out here in Peel region, Uh, she ran 14.59, a personal best um, after years of injury. And Kate's in her 30s now. So to to, to rebound from years of injuries and come back and run a personal best, qualify for Rio, 14 minutes, 15 nine seconds that's a huge deal especially from uh someone that you know like the running community has had high hopes for for a long time here she is punching her ticket to the olympics uh if we're lucky enough to have them at the same time saturday afternoon mohammed ahmed uh from hamilton an amazing runner uh five and ten k he drives down to the 1500 meters gets trampled like literally gets trampled in the race has to pull out of the race because somebody clipped his heel people literally ran over him uh, he gets up off the track, comes back at nighttime 
runs the 5K, runs 13 minutes, 18 seconds, wins this race at the, at the American Track League out in Los Angeles. My question to you, Dave Zirin, is we're in on all three of these, but one of these is the most impressive weekend or performance of the weekend for you. Which is it? I mean, I did a deep dive into this, and I think it's Kate Van Buskirk because, I mean, I've never understood the mentality of the athlete who's in their mid-late 30s, who's coming off of her injuries and is still able to perform at such a high level. The amount of dedication that that takes when sometimes, you know, it hurts me to get out of bed in the morning is, is just one of the things that I think is remarkable about sports and remarkable about human will in general. So Kate Van Buskirk, that's where I go. Yeah, her, her Instagram and Twitter handle is at Kate V Beast. She is a beast and she always has been from the time she was a teenager. And again, like in context matters in this context, beast is like about the highest compliment you can pay somebody. She's a beast. Megan, what do you think? I'm with Dave on this one, especially coming back from injuries in your thirties. It is tough to just come back from injuries and live your life comfortably as a former yes. uh, high level elite athlete, like she is like they all are really and truly, but to be able to do it and then absolutely destroy what you've ran before and really and truly for me all three of them are insanely impressive because there's no chance I could run the way they do and why would I want to like the fact they want to <laughs> throws me off and is insanely impressive to me but I got to go with Dave on this one it's got to be Kate okay perfect now as much as I want to choose uh Kate from Peel region as much as I want to choose Mohammed Ahmed who is an absolute marvel like to compete at the world level at the men's 5k and 10k with the amount of talent that's like this bottleneck of talent that's there right now is insane and he's not one of these uh top canadian type folks he is literally one of the best in the world like you look at him he is like he's all lungs and femurs really long levers but he can fly and this is what makes him a great runner but i'm gonna go with andrea sakafian only because like the you don't see people smash national records like this, especially the 10,000 meters. Because one of these events like the IOC is trying to ease out of the Olympics because it's the longest track race and they, they think it's too long and too boring for young fans and blah, blah, blah. But it's a beautiful race to watch if you're patient enough to watch it. And the IOC is trying to phase this race out and World Athletics is trying to phase this race out. But these amazing athletes keep giving us reasons to tune in. So Andrea Sakafian, national record. Congrats to you. I'm all in on you having the most impressive Canadian distance running performance in a really competitive weekend. Last one, Dave Stradamus strikes again. A couple weeks ago, he told us that the Basketball Africa League would continue to make news, especially as it relates to Rwanda. And guess who shows up in Rwanda and plays for the Patriots? One Jermaine Cole, better known as J. Cole, the rapper, uh, follows up his new album and this uh, freestyle over 93 to infinity. Uh, with 17 minutes, he played 17 minutes with the, in the Patriots win over the Rivers Hoopers Basketball Club of Nigeria. He scored three points, had two assists. Dave Zyron, you in or out on Jermaine Cole averaging three points for the rest of the season? Well, I'm in only because, I mean, he called his album that he just dropped off season. <laughs> so, I mean, anybody who's that successful musically, who clearly considers music to be the hobby and basketball to be life, I think has the, the possibility to pull out one three-pointer a game uh, out of his bag of tricks. And so, and why bet against J. Cole? It just seems like a bad idea. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on J. Cole averaging 3.1 points a game. Megan, you in or out on J. Cole averaging more than three points this season? I'm in on him averaging more than three points. They brought him in and put him on this roster because he is a long-range three-point shooter. It's something that we've seen in his Instagram videos and Twitter videos that went viral when we found out J. Cole could hoop. And we all thought he was trying to make a run for, you know, NBA roster, the G League, whatever it may be. He's playing in BAL, but I, I also want to bring it back to the fact that he should not be the headline of this weekend because they did something unprecedented and historic with this league. And I think it's fantastic for African basketball players who are now getting another chance to show their talents. But I'm in on J. Cole averaging six to eight points a game. I am in on J. Cole averaging more than three points a game, but backing into it. One, J. Cole, J. Cole was a walk-on, I think, at St. John's. But like a, a walk-on basketball player on a Division One team is a very good player. And he's better than most of the people that most of you people watching have ever played against. Like you run up against a, a Division One walk-on in like a, some men's league, he will he will give you the blues. He will give you the blues. Um, 
But J. Cole is also 36 years old, so we got to keep that in mind, right? And there's a difference between playing in, on Instagram and playing in real life. And I wondered about, like, the level of play in the league and the fact that J. Cole can play 17 minutes kind of tells me that the level of play is not too high. But here's how J. Cole is going to back into it. Is they're going to come up they're going to they're going to come up into a game where they're either ahead by a lot or losing by a lot and they're just going to say hey j cole just shoot just shoot so he's going to have one of these games where he scores like 12 points on um five of 15 from three and he's going to get his 12 points and that's good because we're taking the mean that's going to pull the mean up to about five or six so i'm all in on j cole at some point during a blowout just having this flurry of offense and dragging that average up megan Well, keep in mind, so in the article Jesse Jesse Washington did for the undefeated, there was a scouting report on J. Cole. They defended him very well. They did not allow him to get open looks. They did not allow him to really get uh, get open in areas that we would see maybe a Steph Curry do it. So there's clearly a respect level from the opposing coaches in this league that they know J. Cole can shoot the ball, and he's not just some celebrity coming in to try and play the game and and make, make it fun for PR. So if there's a scouting report on you, it means that you have a level of respect, in my opinion, as a basketball player. So I can actually see him averaging more because of the fact that he's going to find a way and his coach will now have to find a way to get him open in situations when he gets on the floor. You guys know what the scouting report is on Bring It In? What's that? Watch it every week. Best panel in the business. <laughs> exactly. What do they say in, in basketball? Uh, off the bus range, you got to guard them the second they, they get off the bus. That's us in uh, sports panels. Again, my favorite 40-ish minutes of the week. Uh, I love these Monday morning meetups. You guys usually, as the audience, get to, to witness the whole thing on Tuesday night. Uh, we have as much fun as you guys do, maybe more. Uh, I don't do this alone. In Washington, D.C., Hamilton's own Megan McPeak. Tell the people where they can find you. As always, on the Twitterverse, at Megan McPeak, spelt with an H, because that is the correct way to do it. Uh Uh-huh. Dave Zirin, D.C., tell the people where they can find you between episodes. Oh, you can find me at Edge of Sports. You can find me in front of my television watching the Wizards or the Mystics. Either of those (laughs) things, I'm there to be found. Perfect. And I, as usual, am your host, Morgan Campbell. I'm at Morgan P. Campbell on Twitter, at Morgan P. Campbell on Instagram. Too old for Snapchat and TikTok. Uh, Probably too young for Triller, too, but everybody's too young for Triller. Uh, In the meantime, uh, it's been fun. As usual, if you like what you heard, hit like. If you dislike what you heard, but you're still here, hit dislike. We take all the engagements. They all matter. We're trying to make the algorithm happy. Uh, And Dave and Megan and I are going to go regroup from this. And we will see you guys back in one week's time on Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. Everybody stay safe.